at the end of 2003, going into 2004, OIF won, Operation Iraqi Freedom won. There's like seven OIFs. When, when you and I went to Ramadi, we, we actually got two stars on our campaign ribbon because we mm-hmm. were there for two separate, oh, actually three separate OIFs. Yep. Um, January 1st of that following year, it was a new one. Right. It kept shifting on us. Yep. Um, so that being said, during OIF-1, U.S. and coalition forces are fighting Saddam's military, essentially. They're fighting the Ba'athist party, right? So this this whole you know, Al-Qaeda in Iraq and this insurgency mindset wasn't a thing in that first year of the war. When you get into 2004, it starts becoming prevalent, right? You start having these, these Islamic terrorist organizations, anti-coalition organizations that start sprouting up all over the place. They start introducing things like IEDs, suicide IEDs, vehicle-borne suicide IEDs, right? So uh, SV bids and all this stuff. They yeah, get creative with it. Things are, things start to heat up in 2004. And the focal point of all of that is the Al-Anbar province. But even more specifically, if you were to narrow that down into where things really started kicking off, it would be Fallujah. Um, now, just to give you an idea, the way Fallujah is as a city, even even... You know, the locals in Iraq, people that live in Baghdad, for instance, would tell you, don't go to Fallujah. It's a crazy city. Like, they're backwoods. They don't trust anybody that's not from there. Case in point, when Baghdad is celebrating Saddam's capture and then his subsequent execution, Mm. and they're tearing down his statues and slapping it with their flip-flops and all that stuff, Fallujah is almost in a riot. The civilians in Fallujah are pissed about it. Because, again, this is like, this is where a lot of the former Ba'athist military guys live. You have, most of the city is out of work now because Saddam's military has been, you know, basically decimated. There is no more military to go to anymore. And, uh, and their outlook on U.S. and coalition forces being there is not positive like the other parts of the country. Um, I say all that to get us to where this story begins. So... Um, in March, well, on March 31st, 2004, there is going to be uh, a team of four security contractors that work for Blackwater Security Consulting Group. And these four guys are super experienced, former, mil- former military guys. Uh, one's a former Navy SEAL. One's a former Army Ranger. Another guy was in the 82nd Airborne. One of them actually got the Bronze Star in Afghanistan earlier in the war, right? So these four guys are very experienced um, combat fighters you know they know what they're doing they had escorted a supply run somewhere in al Anbar province earlier that day and i believe they were trying to make their way back to baghdad they wanted to take a shortcut through ramadi to cut some time off their, or i'm sorry through fallujah to cut some time off their their trip at this point in time fallujah is the most dangerous city in iraq possibly the world right the, this start of the insurgency war, Al Qaeda in Iraq, and all the other numerous, you know, Islamic terror organizations that spring up from this war, they're all starting to make an appearance there in Fallujah. Well, they decide to do this sh- shortcut through the city without notifying the U.S. military presence that's in control of that AO, right? So the Marines in that sector, that that's, they belong to uh, Regimental Combat Team 1, they have no clue that these guys are getting ready to roll through the city. If they did, they might have been able to send some kind of support to them. Well, I'm sure many of you remember seeing the images of what happens next, um, but I want to I read a quote from this book by Bing West called No True Glory because it really... It really is eye-opening, and it shows you the kind of stuff uh, that we are fighting over there, um, and the kind of hate that that you know that that those ideals and 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 um, those organizations spread throughout the populace that made the fighting so nasty. Um, but in his book, No True Glory, Bing West describes what happens next like this: "Quote." The contractors crept along in the dense traffic, passing on their right the main police station and the walled compound of the city council, formerly the headquarters for the Bath Party. 
The government city in Midtown was the final landmark where the contractors could have turned back had any Iraqi policemen waved them down. No Iraqi, sorry, no Iraqi though raised a hand to warn them. Minutes later, emerging from the doorways of shops, insurgents dashed into the street and sprayed both vehicles. Some claimed an Iraqi police pickup had been leading the SUVs and had sped away at the last minute, which that sounds very feasible. Um, very but, well could but it happen. could have also been not the case either. Um, continuing on with the quote, uh, with no armor plating on the vehicles, the four men inside were riddled with bullets. They had had no chance to fire back. The firing ceased, the shooters drove off, and a crowd of men and boys approached. When an American with bullet wounds in his chest staggered out and fell to the ground, he was kicked, stomped, stabbed, and butchered. A boy ran up with a can of gasoline, doused the SUVs, and struck a match. The black smoke pointed like a finger up into the sky, attracting a swelling crowd. Egged on by older men, boys dragged the smoldering corpses onto the pavement and beat the charred flesh with their flip-flops to show that Americans were scum under the soles of their shoes. A body was ripped apart and a leg attached to a rope was tossed over a power line above the highway. This continued all day, the crowd spurring on one another shouting, Viva Mujahideen, long live the resistance. Two of the charred corpses were dragged behind a car through the souk, which is a part of the, the town. Okay. Past rows of, uh, sorry, past rows of small shops and hundreds of cheering men to the green trestle bridge that the Americans called the Brooklyn Bridge. There the mob hung the bodies from an overhead girder, two black lumps dangling at the end of ropes. Crowds in the sook and along the highway were swept up in the murderous atmosphere. No police tried to restore order. No fire truck put out the flames smoldering around the SUVs. No ambulance came for the bodies. When two Iraqi nurses tried to take the bodies to a hospital, they were told to leave or be shot, end quote. That's quite an image there, man. It is. And, and listen, uh, the footage of this was, was aired on international television. I remember seeing it with my own eyes, I'm sure as you do too. Same, same as the, uh, the towers going down September 11th. All of this stuff was on TV for all of us to see. Yeah, and, uh, and so obviously the political and the public reaction to these images was overwhelmingly unanimous. There's some kind of retaliatory action had to be done against you know, the insurgents that made this happen. They couldn't, be just, they couldn't just be allowed to go free. Someone had to pay. 